After this, while they delayed at Katiora, some of the men lived by purchasing from the market, and others by pillaging the territory of Paphlagonia. The Paphlagonians, however, were extremely clever in kidnapping the stragglers, and at night they tried to inflict harm upon such of the Greeks as were quartered at some distance from the rest. Consequently, they and the other Greeks were in a very hostile mood toward one another. Then Corylos, who chanced at the time to be the ruler of Paphlagonia, sent ambassadors to the Greeks with horses and fine raiment, bearing word that Corylos was ready to do the Greeks no wrong and to suffer no wrong at their hands. The generals replied that they would take counsel with the army on this matter, but meanwhile they received the ambassadors as their guests at dinner, inviting in also such of the other men in the army as seemed to them best entitled to an invitation. Welcome to another edition of Highlights from Xenophon's Anabasis, Book 6. This is another great book, uh, or chapter of the book. Just so you know, we usually think of divisions in terms, in our books today, in terms of uh, chapters, but with ancient text, we speak of divisions in terms of books. And this convention is related to the ancient technology of writing. Instead of books, they usually had scrolls, actually. And what we would call a book today, well, in scholarly parlance, talking about the ancient world, you'd call a codex. And those didn't really come along until the Roman period. So Xenophon would have written his books on scrolls, on books of wound up papyrus leaves. And uh, so these, when we speak of like book one, two, three of the Anabasis, these are books that are actually about the size of your standard ancient scroll. So it would have taken seven scrolls or books, or biblia is the Greek word, or biblos, typically about 30 to 40 pages would have taken that many to um, seven of those to write the Anabasis. That's about how long the work is. Anyway, book six of seven of Xenophon's Anabasis. In this chapter, chaos is knocking at the door again. And there's danger, there's travel, adventure, deception, justice, injustice, and a little bit of silliness here and there, and many more things. It's a lot of fun. We begin the story, as you just heard, with a party. I'm Alex Petkus. You're listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the great Greeks and Romans following the lead of Plutarch's lives. But I encounter other great books along the way and other great figures, leaders, writers, worth taking a look at for you, in my opinion. And so in these highlights episodes, I'm sharing with you some of the best stuff from my research. Okay, so you recall last time the Greek army fought their way through Asia Minor, through Armenia, etc., etc. They got to the coast of Asia Minor, to the south coast of the Black Sea, which they called the Euxine Sea, which means the friendly to strangers sea. That might be one of those words that is a euphemism that means the opposite of what it actually says, because as you recall, this is kind of hostile territory for a lot of the for the Greeks here, at least there are some Greek cities along the coast dotting the the ports, the nice harbors of the Black Sea that the Greeks were good at finding and uh, kind of establishing trading post beachheads through persuasion or force, more likely force in most cases. And we'll get to a few instances that uh, kind of illuminate this whole process of colonization. But the quote that I read from earlier is the very beginning of the book. And so they've been raiding the territory of the Paphlagonians. These are non-Greek peoples. And the Paphlagonians have been, in turn, raiding them, you know, kidnapping stragglers. Uh, so they've been getting roughed up and roughing each other up in return. And Paphlagonia, by the way, this is the region of Asia Minor that is kind of midway along the coast of the Black Sea, the south coast of the Black Sea. It's kind of a large, wide headland that sticks out into the Black Sea Paphlagonians are mentioned by Homer, and this kind of is the, the name for the region uh, throughout antiquity. So it's a good, good name to, to remember, Paphlagonia. Uh, so anyway, the, the Paphlagonians come to the Greeks, and they decide to make peace, or try. And the Greeks invite the ambassadors for dinner. 
And they're in the territory of Katiora on the Black Sea. They haven't reached Sinope yet. Uh, so they're still in a pretty, pretty wild land. But here's the feast. And this is a famous scene. I like it because it shows you an example of people thinking about making a deal, not sure if they want to, not sure if they trust each other, but they're going to they're gonna test out the idea over some fun and games. And this is a situation I think that you're going to encounter a lot in life, in business and affairs. Before you negotiate or even before you re- resolve a dispute, uh, it's good to have some leisure time together with your counterpart often. Okay. So let's get into it. By sacrificing some of the cattle, I'm reading now, and also other animals, they provided an adequate feast, and they dined, reclining on straw mats, then drank from cups made of horn, which they found in the country. That's about the only enjoying the local fair scene that we're going to have here. But they, So they're drinking out of these horn cups like, uh, like barbarian lords. After they had made libations and sang the pion, Two Thracians rose up first. The Greeks uh, have Thracians in their army. These were brought in by Clearchus. Uh, So these are guys on their team. So two Thracians rose up first and began a dance in full armor to the music of a flute, leaping high and lightly and using their sabers. Finally, one struck the other. It seemed to everyone that the man had been mortally wounded. And he fell artfully. And the Paphlagonians cried out. They're fooled by this scene. Then the first man despoiled the other of his arms and marched off singing the Sitalkas, some Thracian hymn, while the other Thracians carried off the fallen dancer as though he were dead. In fact, he had not been hurt at all. After this, some of the Aenianians and Magnesians, Greeks, arose and danced under arms the so-called Carpia. The manner of the dance was this, and it kind of means fruity dance or, uh, I don't know, crop gathering dance. A man is sowing and driving a yoke of oxen, his arms laid at one side, and he turns about frequently as one in fear. A robber approaches, and soon as the sower sees him coming, he snatches up his arms, goes out to meet him, and fights with him to save his oxen. The two men do all this in rhythm to the music of the flute. Finally, the robber binds the man and drives off the oxen, or sometimes the master of the oxen binds the robber, and then he yokes him alongside his oxen, his hands tied behind him, and drives off. So you you kind of get the sense here that uh, Xenophon has seen this one a few times. Moving on here just a little bit more. After this, a Mycian came in, carrying a light shield in each hand. And at one moment in his dance, he would go through a pantomime as though two men were arrayed against him. Again, he would use his shields as though against one antagonist, and he would again swirl around and throw somersaults while holding the shields in his hands so that he seemed to offer a fine spectacle. Lastly, he danced the Persian dance clashing his shields together and crouching down and then rising up again. All this he did, keeping time to the music of the flute. Wouldn't you have loved to be at this scene? Okay, just a little bit more here. After him, the Mantineans came forward and some of the other Arcadians arose, arrayed in their finest arms and accoutrements that they could command, and marched in time to the accompaniment of a martial rhythm, played on the flute, and sang the paean and danced just as the Arcadians do in their festal processions, their festal processions in honor of the gods. And the Paphlagonians, these are their guests, as they looked on, thought it most strange that all the dances were under arms. They have all their uh, war gear on during these dances. Thereupon, one Mycian, seeing how astounded they were, persuaded one of the Arcadians who had a dancing girl to let him bring her in after dressing her up in the finest way he could and giving her a light shield. And she danced the Pyrrhic with grace. That's a war dance from Sparta. Then there was great applause, and the Paphlagonians asked whether their women also fought by their side. 
And the Greeks replied that these women were precisely the ones who put the king to flight from his camp. Such was the end of that evening. So, that's Xenophon recalling some good, respectable, soldierly merriment, and he even includes the joke that he remembered from that occasion. So they have this feast, and what do you know? It works. And the next day they make an agreement not to harm each other, and this makes everything easier. So the next time your boss wants to cut back on your entertainment budget, I think you should bring him this passage from Xenophon's Anabasis. Yeah, do that next time you have an important negotiation, a party like this. Uh, but seriously, I think this is really important to keep in mind, and I think it's even more important now in our age of internet relationships and deals conducted often by people who never meet each other in person. Groups that have high trust amongst themselves tend to have higher motivation. They get things done better and quicker. So if you want to build trust, you know, get physically close to each other. Go out to dinner. Alcohol often gets brought in for these situations for obvious reasons. It makes you let your guard down, builds trust. You kind of see what people do when they're they're not being so careful. The Greeks certainly saw this as one of the advantages of drinking together. But note there that the Greeks and their allies, they're not so drunk that they can't dance well, that they can't pull off a convincing fake death scene, for example. Yeah, so get together in person. I did this with a potential business partner lately, and it made a huge difference. Uh, it's not always possible, but it's good. All right, so with this breathing room that they have uh, after this peace with the Paphlagonians, they find some way to catch a ride, the whole army, on some boats. Xenophon doesn't really specify how they get a hold of these boats. Uh, they don't own them, though. Uh, but they get a ride all the way to Sinope, and that's a Greek settlement about halfway along the coast of Asia Minor. But when they do get there, it's bad news that they receive. Chirisophus, remember Chirisophus, the Lacedaemonian or the Spartan first among equals leader guy. Well, he went off last book to try to get some help from his friend, the Navarch, Anaxibius of Sparta. He's waiting for them there at Sinope, and he brings the news that there are no ships coming from the Spartans. But Anaxibius, the Navarch, said, if the army can make its way out of the Euxine, out of the friendly to strangers sea, out of the Black Sea, and Exibius may be able to find work for them. And the landmark that he has in mind for uh, making it out of the Black Sea is probably the city of Byzantium, which has got a Spartan garrison in it now, former Athenian ally. Byzantium is a Greek city, Yes, it is that Byzantium, the famous one that went on to become Constantinople. So now they've got to figure out a way to get to Byzantium. But before that, they come to the conclusion that they should choose one single commander of the army. And here's how Xenophon explains it. By this time, since it seemed that they were getting near Greece, the question came into their minds more than before how they might reach home with a little something in hand. He's talking about some kind of a plunder situation. They came to the conclusion, therefore, that if they should choose one commander, that one man would be able to handle the army better, whether by night or day, than a number of commanders. That if there should be need of concealment, he would be better able to keep matters secret. Or again, if there should be need of getting ahead of an adversary, he would be less likely to be late. For, thought the soldiers, there would be no need of conferences of generals with one another, but the plan resolved upon by the one man would be carried through, whereas in the past the generals had acted in all matters in accordance with a majority vote. Going on here. And uh, here's where it gets interesting for our author here. As they thought over these things, they turned to Xenophon. The captains came to him and said that this was the opinion of the army, and each one of them, with manifestations of goodwill, urged him to undertake the command. So, 
the army is going to take a vote as a whole. And the captains are saying, hey, Xenophon, your name came up. It's going to come up. You're going to get nominated and you should take it. Xenophon's not sure, though. And on the one hand, there are good reasons to accept the post. He says, as for Xenophon, he was inclined on some accounts to accept the command, for he thought that if he did so, the greater would be the honor he would enjoy among his friends, and the greater his name when it should reach his city, while furthermore it might chance that he could be the means of accomplishing some good things for the army. So he sees the potential here, and I think it's interesting that he points out as one of the strongest motivations he has that it's honor. And this is something that the Greeks generally took as a sign of fitness for leadership, being highly motivated by honor. Philotemia is their word for the desire for honor. Honor is time, so that you want somebody with that quality. You want your leaders to be more motivated by honor than by money. And Xenophon's definitely got plenty of that philotemia. He's not afraid to show it. He wants you to see that, that this is uh, part of his character. He's you know trying to p portray himself well and hold himself up as an example of good leadership. Good men desire honor in his mind. And he could certainly stand to win a lot of honor if he took on this command. But there are some drawbacks that he's thinking about too. On the other hand, when he reflected that no man can clearly see how the future will turn out, and that for this reason he, there was a danger that he might even lose the reputation he had already won, he was doubtful. So, there are big risks. Risks chiefly to your honor. And that's a very big risk for somebody like Xenophon. You can lose your honor if you do a bad job, right? Right? The Greek word honor, time, is what others perceive to be your inherent value or usefulness. And if you're incompetent, that really plummets, doesn't it? So how's he going to decide? Well, Xenophon decides to sacrifice to the gods for their advice. And I'm going to read you how he describes it here. Now, pay attention to what Xenophon talks about here. It's a little weird, but I think it's really illustrative, actually, of something that we can take away from this. So, bear with me. Hear me out. Here's Xenophon. Unable as he was to decide the question, it seemed best to him to consult the gods, and he accordingly brought two victims to the altar and proceeded to offer sacrifice to King Zeus, the very god that the oracle at Delphi had prescribed for him. And it was likewise from this God, as he believed, and we told that story in book three, I believe, and it was likewise from this God, as he believed, that the dream came, which he had at the time when he took the first steps towards assuming a share in the charge of the army. This is the dream he had the day after they lost Cyrus with the lightning on the house of his father and so on. Moreover, he recalled that when he was setting out from Ephesus to be introduced to Cyrus, an eagle screamed upon his right. It was sitting, however, and the soothsayer who was conducting him said that while the omen was one suited to the great rather than to an ordinary person, and while it betokened glory, it nevertheless portended suffering. So Xenophon's, he's consulting the omens on his way to meet Cyrus too here. And, you know, he has a soothsayer and they see a, an eagle sitting on a branch or something and it screams. And so the soothsayer is helping him to interpret all this. So it betokens glory, but it portends suffering, I guess, because the bird is sitting. Yeah. So for the reason that other birds are most apt to attack the eagle when it is sitting. Still, he said, the omen did not betoken gain. For it is rather while the eagle is on the wing that it gets its food. So it was then that Xenophon made sacrifice. He's coming back to the present moment. So Xenophon sacrifices. And the god signified to him about this command. He's thinking of taking up quite clearly that he should neither strive for the command nor accept it in case he should be chosen. 
Such was the issue of this matter. So he sacrifices. And sacrificing will mean something here like killing an animal ritually at an altar and then inspecting the entrails and also looking around for signs around you, probably from a bird. And uh, one take on sacrifice as a decision-making procedure is that it's a way to open yourself up to suggestions from intuition, to pay closer attention to nature, to take a step back and peer deeper into the mysteries of life even. Right? You're killing an animal, you're cutting it open, and seeing how it all works in a way. There's a kind of an element of wonder there. This life that was just alive and existing and now it's dead and you're kind of looking at that fact. And often the gods speak to you through things like the size and the shape of the liver. Does the liver have lobes on it? But you know, you're taking a life, you're dealing with a freshly dead creature like this and there's something pretty visceral about that, don't you think? And you're also looking at the, the, the animals around you, you're trying to see the quaking of the leaves and which way are the birds flying, you're getting really quiet. You're connecting with nature in a deep, instinctive way. And you're also connecting with deeper feelings within yourself, deeper than the chatter that's going on in your own head that is always billing itself as your rational mind. So whether the gods actually speak to you or not, you're speaking with yourself, for sure, in a kind of a deep way. And from a Greek perspective, well, it could be both and, right? You know, the gods could be talking to you through your own kind of self-perception. And uh, today, I think people might say, I prayed about it, and God told me, and so on. Yes, that's good, too. The point is, you're opening yourself up to counsel and suggestions from some force beyond your conscious mind that you don't understand, some deeper source of intelligence. And when Xenophon does this, the answer that he gets is, don't try, don't put yourself up for, for command, for the nomination, and if you are nominated and chosen, reject it. Which is interesting, right? You often think of the people who talk to the gods a lot as you know, megalomaniacs, people who use the divine for confirmation of their own selfish agenda. But, you know, Xenophon here is, uh, is really using that act to restrain himself in a way. Uh, so the army assembles, and sure enough, Xenophon's name comes up. They nominate him, and they haven't voted yet, uh, but he gives a speech. And he basically says, thank you so much, so honored, I don't think it makes sense for me to be elected. And he gives his reason. At this point is where he gives like a pretty good reason why he shouldn't take the command. He says, well, look, there's a Spartan present. I don't think I should be the leader because, he reminds them, the Spartans are now the supreme power in Greece. You may recall from the life of Lysander or Agesilaus, Anyway, the political situation, the geopolitical situation is there was this long, long war between Athens and Sparta and the Spartans have finally won and they are the supreme imperial power in the Aegean and in the Greek world. And he says, basically, if we ever as an army need to make a plea for favorable treatment from the Spartans, which is very likely considering the circumstances, it'll be a lot easier if we have a Spartan in charge. And he says... You know, even if you don't choose a Spartan, I'm not your guy. Whoever you choose, I'll follow them gladly. Now, so here I think we're maybe seeing some of the considerations that might have occurred to Xenophon as he was taking the time to discern the will of the gods. So then, of course, after he makes this very eloquent, reasonable rejection of the post, this just makes them want him more as a leader. And they shout, oh, Xenophon! You are even more worthy in our eyes. Xenophon, lead us. And they keep insisting. And then he pulls out his trump card that he has, of course, made ready, as we've seen. And he says, well, soldiers, actually, I was sacrificing to the gods about this decision earlier. If you must know the truth, the signs were very clear. I should not take the post. 
So in other words, he says, well, fine, I prayed about it. And that's what God told me. And that's pretty hard to argue with, isn't it? So they accept this. And they elect Chirisophus the Spartan, the guy who was first among equals before. Now he's officially the chief commander of the army. So they set out from Sinope, and they're sailing. They're making their way along the coast in these ships of unknown provenance. Uh, but they're sailing along, and here's an interesting thing Xenophon says about some of the places that they're passing. And coursing along, they saw Jason's Cape, where the Argo is said to have come to anchor. That's the famous voyage of Jason and the Argonauts on their way to get the Golden Fleece mythic story. They're also seeing uh, the mouths of the rivers, first the Thermodon, then the Iris, third the Halys, big rivers, and then the Parthenius. And after they had passed this river, they arrived at Heraclea, a Greek city and a colony of the Megarians situated in the territory of the Mariandinians, whoever they are. Um, they don't really come up again. And they came to anchor alongside the Acherusian Chersonese, the Acherusian Peninsula. That's what that means. Where Hercules, or Heracles, is said to have descended to Hades after the dog Cerberus at a spot where they now show the marks of his descent, reaching to a depth of more than two stadia. The state is about 600 feet, so there's some big cave that the locals point out. Well, that's where Hercules went down into hell. He was chasing after Cerberus. That's one of his 12 labors. And they're probably pointing to little scuff marks on the walls. Oh, this is where Hercules, you know, rested or got a hold of the dog's tail and they were fighting around and it banged a dent in the wall. You can imagine the kind of things that they say about that kind of place. So it's a, it's a really interesting kind of spooky land far on the edges of the Greek world. Greeks have this tendency to kind of mentally colonize fringe territories with their stories. I think it's really fascinating. Uh, so if you want to look this up, Her Heraclea, it's Eregli in Turkey. There's a big steel mill there today. Um, so they're, they're there at Heraclea. And a dispute arises. And it's not totally clear what's going on but it seems that some of the soldiers are really feeling that they're getting close to home and they haven't gotten this fabulous wealth and riches that they set out to get. And maybe while they're still in this wild territory where you can loot and plunder seemingly without penalty, they should try to stock up before they get home. And so a lot of the soldiers in the army demand that their captains use threats of force to basically extort the local people of Heraclea these are Greeks, by the way, that they should present the army with a gift. And they're basically just trying to get, you know, get them to give them free stuff. Xenophon and Chirisophus, well, Chirisophus is the important one, but Xenophon's really backing him up here. They both refuse. They say, this is a really bad idea. This is unjust, coercing a friendly Greek city. And uh, you can imagine some of the reasons they might have used. For one thing, if you commit injustice against barbarians, then that's kind of fine. But if you commit injustice against Greeks out abroad, you know, Greeks talk to Greeks and word will get around that you're hubristic, etc. It, it, it could really not be good for the future if they do that. Now, but the soldiers don't care. They pick some of their own captains to go in and make some demands. And they do this. They present some demands with the Heraclean assembly and the Heracleans respond, oh, yeah, that seems reasonable. Let us think about it. And then they proceed to pull in all of their belongings in from the countryside into the walls, and they're basically getting ready for a fight. Uh, so that doesn't go very well. And so the, the soldiers don't have siege gear. They, they can't really do much about this, and they, they just get angry, and things get worse. From there, it just turns into a mutiny. And the largest contingent in the army decide to break away. These are the Arcadians and the Achaeans, who are actually the majority of the army. These are basically soldiers from the Sparta's Peloponnesian League, and the Peloponnese, Arcadia, and Achaea are big constituencies within that league. 
And they say, yeah, we've been doing most of the fighting anyway. There's like almost 5,000 of them. And uh, they say, we're going to go our separate way and we're going to find our own fortune without you guys. And Chirisophus is furious, despondent, and he kind of sulks. And that was the end of his soul command, as Xenophon says, which only lasted six or seven days. And Chirisophus appoints somebody else to take his place and command the troops that he's left with. So Chirisophus has about 2,000 men that are loyal to the, you know, him and Sparta. And Xenophon is actually left in charge of the other third fragment of the army, about 1,400 men, probably what's left from Proxenus's Boeotians and whatever else. And Xenophon here, before he, he takes up the command, though, he, he realizes, I could just leave. This is kind of annoying. I have enough money now to buy my way back to Greece. I can put this all behind me. Why am I even staying? And he thinks about it, and he decides to sacrifice to the gods for some advice. And he sacrifices to Hercules the leader, Heracles the leader. And the, the god tells him, no, you got to stay and see this through. So he does. And he gets put in charge of uh, block number three of the troops. And the, these three blocks of the army basically go their separate ways. It's a very kind of sad moment. But the Arcadians and the Achaeans were pretty lucky that Xenophon stayed on because soon they go off inland on their own and they get to plundering and they get in trouble, deep trouble with the local Thracians and a lot of them get killed and they get surrounded and sieged on a hill. And Xenophon gets word of this and he persuades the army, we have to rescue these guys. They're our friends, they're Greeks, even though we've had a dispute. And I'm going to skip a lot of this episode. It's fun and it's interesting, uh, but it's mainly just a lot of fighting. There is one cool trick that Xenophon uses. So they're surrounded, the Arcadians and the Achaeans are surrounded on this hill by these Thracians and night falls and Xenophon and his troops come to the vicinity and they spread out and light a bunch of fires and then at the signal they extinguish all of their fires and then they just go to sleep for the night and they wake up the next morning and they go up to the mountain and everybody's gone and then they make their way back to the coast they basically track the greek army and uh they catch the arcadians and the achaeans and uh they realize what has happened basically the thracians interpreted the fires as a, a large army spread out and then the extinguishing of the fires as a sign that the greeks were getting ready to make a night raid and so they just ran away so xenophon this was kind of his trick to uh, to see if he could spook the thracians as he explains and it worked so they link up and they say sorry to each other and it's a very happy moment. They greet each other like brothers. They take back all the nasty things that they said about Xenophon, which they did. And they make their way back to the sea, meet up with the Spartans under Chirisophus. And they all swear oaths not to break up the army again. And if anybody proposes such an idea, to put him to death. So essentially, Xenophon's been trying to keep this chaos at bay. The, the, the leaders have been trying to keep this chaos and disorder at bay and they just had their case made by this disastrous splitting up of the fellowship uh, people going off on their own and not being able to handle themselves and so the place that they end up reuniting the army is called Calpi it's a nice spot there's a harbor there but there's not a city there there's no settlement uh, it's nice though it's got figs and grapes and Nice wine and wheat and beans. And at this point, the rumor of a potential city founding comes up again. And here's what Xenophon says. And I think this passage is interesting because it shows you a sense of who these men are and why they came. You know, who joins a startup? Who signs up for a great adventure or a quest? We often think of 
mercenaries and negative terms in our day and age. But here's what Xenophon says about these men. The men took up quarters on the beach by the sea, refusing to encamp on the spot which might become a city. Indeed, the fact of their coming to this place at all seemed to them the result of scheming on the part of some people who wished to found a city. For most of the soldiers had sailed away from Greece to undertake this service for pay, not because their means were scanty, but because they knew by report of the noble character of Cyrus. Some brought other men with them. Some had even spent money of their own on the enterprise, while still another class had abandoned fathers and mothers or had left children behind with the idea of getting money to bring back to them all because they heard that the other people who served with Cyrus enjoyed abundant good fortune. Being men of this sort, therefore, they longed to return in safety to Greece. End quote. Uh, so you remember last episode, Xenophon was getting accused of wanting to found a city, and indeed he thought it might be a good idea, but he wasn't going to try to do anything that went against the wishes of the army. Um, he had to defend himself for that. But once again, people aren't totally convinced that he's gotten the city founding bug out of his system. Or maybe other people as well were interested in this idea. Uh, but they don't want to get stuck here. And so they decide, we're not even going to camp in the nicest part. Because that just is one step on a slippery slope towards founding a city. Uh, so they, they build a fort and it kind of not so nice part of this area and uh, they're now in a region called Bithynia and Bithynia is properly the territory of a guy you may remember from the life of Agesilaus if you've listened to that or if you've read it it's the territory of the Persian governor Pharnabazus and Pharnabazus sends some local forces some Athenians, some Thracians, uh, cavalry to try to dislodge the Greeks. There's some fighting, I won't go into it, but they eventually manage to chase Pharnabazus' force away. But meanwhile, while they're there, Chirisophus dies. He was in his 50s, and he got sick, and he died. And you get the sense that Xenophon respected him enough, but he didn't really see him as a particularly great leader. Xenophon doesn't bother to give him an epitaph kind of description like he did with Proxenus and Clearchus and Menon back in book two, or Cyrus for that matter. Uh, but the guy who replaces Chirisophus, Neon is his name. He's uh, from Asine, which is a local town near Sparta. So he's kind of an honorary Spartan. But this guy doesn't matter. He's worse than Chirisophus. Uh, but that's who they're stuck with. Interestingly, though, they're not building a city, right, according to Xenophon, but listen to this. And by this time, there was a great abundance of everything, for market products came in from the Greek cities on all sides, and people coasting past were glad to put in to the harbor, since they heard that a city was being founded and that there was a harbor. Even the hostile peoples who dwelt near began now to send envoys to Xenophon, for they heard that he was the man who was making a city of the place to ask what they must do in order to be his friends. And Xenophon would always show these envoys to the soldiers. So it, it almost seems like everybody else is wanting them to found a city. There are a lot of people these days talking about founding new cities, whether it's a network state kind of an idea or the model city idea or, you know, some friend of yours bought a plot of land in West Texas. Uh, well, whatever it is, here's some encouragement, right? When you actually do set out to do something like that, chances are you're going to make a lot of new friends. I mean, they've got Merchants coming in, the Greek merchants passing by, putting into harbor, trying to sell their wares, locals trying to make friends with them. I mean, people see that you're building something big and they, they want to be on the right side of it if they can. So uh, that sort of thing can, can develop its own momentum pretty quickly, which is a good boost. I mean, it comes with its own risks, of course. Now, but even the rumor of founding a city 
which is not true, apparently, is enough in this case to bring people out of the woodwork. They've got goods to sell, services to offer. But Xenophon keeps having to turn these people away. Well, not the merchants, but, you know, he's making a point here when he's saying, I showed these people to the soldiers on every occasion. He's making the point here that he had the opportunity to negotiate some kind of private deal for himself, and he's turning these kind of opportunities down. That's what he's suggesting here. It would be a distraction for him to make some kind of private arrangement. He recognizes uh, there's a lot of potential there, but there's all kinds of potential conflicts of interest as a leader of the army. You know, like maybe when you found your city that we can import goods without taxes and then in exchange, you know, we'll give you a bunch of gold or daughters or what, whatever it is. And he doesn't really specify, but uh, that seems to be what he's hinting at there. Xenophon, as usual, playing the long game, playing the honor game rather than the money game or the material advantage game. Soon enough, though, the Spartan governor of Byzantium arrives. He's a guy named Cleander, and Cleander has brought with him two triremes, two battleships, definitely not enough to carry any substantial portion of the army, and uh, by the way, it's not really explained, but whatever ships they have been using to sail along the coast, these are gone. They are not available anymore. Uh, maybe they were paying for local merchant vessels. Who knows? They're not available. So this guy, Cleander, Spartan governor of Byzantium, Spartan Harmost, he would be in charge of a garrison that is assuring that the Byzantines stay loyal to Sparta. That would be his job. Uh, and he's the sort of guy that gets probably changed out on a regular basis, on an annual basis maybe. Uh, but anyway, he's in charge now, and he's come. Not really clear what his intentions are. Maybe he's hoping that he can recruit this army to solve a problem locally for himself. They're pretty close to Byzantium, maybe only a day's sail away, though they're still in Asia Minor. Maybe he's just wanting to size them up somehow. But they run into problems. Do you remember I mentioned last time there was a guy who abandoned the army? He was given a ship, a Pentaconter, a 50 oared ship, and tasked with bringing supplies or finding help somehow, and then he just sailed away. Well, that guy's name was Dexippus, and he made his way to Byzantium and befriended Cleander. And now he's back. He's with Cleander. Maybe this has something to do with why Cleander's there. So this guy Dexippus, this this traitor, this betrayer in the eyes of at least Xenophon and many of the men, he's there with Cleander. And here's what happens. It so chanced that the army was out foraging when he arrived, when Cleander arrived, while certain individuals had gone in quest of plunder to different places in the mountains and had secured a large number of sheep. So fearing that they might be deprived of them, they told their story to Dexippus. So there's a backstory here. So a couple of pages earlier, Xenophon has said, the army is resolved that if anybody goes out raiding on their own, whatever they capture is communal property of the army. This is a new rule. This is a new deal that clearly was intended to encourage unity and uh, discourage kind of uh, freebootery. Uh, so some guys went off and they got, they got a real plum herd of sheep and they don't want to share it. And they see Dexippus there. Here's the man who can recognize a good deal when he sees it. So they approach this, this Dexippus guy. Dexippus, the, the guy who, uh, okay, well, Xenophon describes it here. They told their story to Dexippus, the man who slipped away from Trapezus with the 50 oared warship. And they urged him to save their sheep for them with the understanding that he was to get some of the sheep himself and give the rest back to them. So he gets a cut. So he immediately proceeded to drive away the soldiers who were standing about and declaring that the animals were public property, according to the arrangement that they made. And then he went straight away and told Cleander that they were attempting robbery. So he's got some muscle with him. 
Xenophon specified earlier, he is a Lacedaemonian perioikos. He's one of the perioikoi, one of the dwellers around who are not full Spartan citizens, but kind of in the Spartan fold. So maybe he's got some kind of uh, official position there with Cleander that he's negotiated for himself. And he's, anyway, he's, he's got the force to back up his deal making here. And he's also going and taking his story to Cleander. Cleander directed him to bring the robber before him. So he seized a man. And here's where it gets ugly. He seized a man. And he was taking him to Cleander. This is one of the troops of the army that was saying, hey, that's not right. But Agassius, happening to meet them, rescued the man, for he was one of his company. Agassius is a captain. And then the other soldiers who were present set about stoning Dexippus, calling him the traitor. And many of the soldiers from the triremes, these are the Spartans from Byzantium, they got frightened and they began to flee toward the sea and Cleander also fled. So this really escalates and uh, Cleander's fleeing to the ships. A Xenophon, however, and the other generals tried to hold them back and they told Cleander that nothing was the matter but that the resolution of the army was the reason for this incident taking place. But Cleander, goaded on by Dexippus and angered on his own account also because he had been frightened, so he's embarrassed that he ran away, Yeah, declared that he would sail away and issue a proclamation forbidding any city to receive them on the ground that they were enemies. And at this time, the Lacedaemonians, the Spartans, held the hegemony over all the Greeks. Upon this, the affair seemed to the Greeks a bad business, and they begged Cleander not to carry out his intention. He replied that no other course would be taken unless they should deliver up the man who began the stoning and the one who rescued Dexippus' prisoner. Now Agassius, whom he thus demanded, had been a friend of Xenophon's all through which was the very reason why Dexippus was slandering him. So, Dexippus and Xenophon seem to have some kind of history of quarreling. Xenophon doesn't really go into details there. There's probably a backstory. But that's the situation. Dexippus trying to uh, cut a private deal with some of the soldiers to go against the rule of uh, sharing communal goods. The soldiers try to stop them. They throw rocks at Dexippus. Dexippus flees to Cleander. Cleander gets one side of the story. And uh, now there's a kind of a standoff here. This is bad. So the captains call a meeting of the army. And some of them are saying, yeah, forget Cleander. Let him go. You know what? But Xenophon explains, no, this is very serious, guys. This isn't just one Spartan governor. If he declares us to be enemies, he could shut us out of basically every Greek city in the world that we care about. He says, here's what we ought to do. Whoever is responsible in any way for rocks being thrown at Dexippus, I know I don't like him either, but he needs to surrender himself to Cleander, whoever started the rock throwing. At the very least, this we have a chance here of absolving the rest of the army as a whole, from being made enemies of the Spartans. And he has a, a telling quote at the end of his little speech here, that as matters are now, it will be hard if we who expected to obtain both praise and honor in Greece shall find instead that we are not even on an equality with the rest of the Greeks, but are shut out of their cities. I think it's interesting here how Xenophon continues to be really concerned about their collective reputation. You know, they all want to go home, live out the rest of their lives, thinking that they've done something honorable and even amazing, right? They defeated King Artaxerxes in a battle. They survived this incredible journey against the odds. And now they're at the risk of exile. It's a very dangerous situation. And Agassius himself, the guy who rescued this poor soldier who was getting dragged away for basically shouting out the truth. Well, he comes forward and he basically says, it's on me, guys. I rescued my soldier. 
because he's a good man. And Dexippus, the guy dragging him off, is a bad man. I'll go answer for myself. And he asks for some backup, some leaders to come with him as he goes to Cleander to help him speak, help, to help make his case with him. So they all get up and they go to Cleander, still standing there by the ships, tapping his foot. And it seems to be all of the generals. Xenophon says the generals go. And Xenophon's there too, of course. And Cleander, now, he was just about ready to sail away, declare them all enemies. Uh, but this, this gesture that they make is, is disarming. And I won't go into all the details, but the leaders of the army, they basically surrender themselves to him. They surrender Agassius. And, you know, they, they tell their side of the story. Dexippus seized a soldier who was basically just saying out loud, proclaiming what they were doing was wrong and stealing. They, they were the ones stealing. And Dexippus just wanted to shut the guy up to, you know, get his, uh, get his little cut. This soldier was spoiling his little profit scheme. And to think, Dexippus was probably going to ruin this guy's life for a few sheep. And then they explain what Dexippus did earlier sailing away they gave him this penticonter this this 50 yard ship and he just abandoned them and cleander is starting to realize he hasn't completely understood the situation correctly up till now but he still thinks okay well fine but you know agassius instigated this stone throwing this is still attempted murder even if Dexippus is bad, and maybe he is, but he should have brought a charge. Agassius should have, you know, accused him before me rather than trying to stone the man and kill him. So I'm going to hold on to Agassius and subject him to trial and figure out what I'm going to do with him. And the generals and Agassius, they all agree. That's fair. Hold on to Agassius. Hold on to our accused soldiers. They... I guess they have another couple of soldiers there with him. One of the, the guy who is actually making the, uh, the initial proclamation against Dexippus that led to the whole incident. He's there with them. Um, so I think this is really interesting because the jurisdiction here is really foggy, right? Like, why should this Spartan be the judge of what's going on, of what's right and wrong here, rather than the Greeks of the army? They've got a bigger army and a camp, and they're much more sovereign in this square of territory than the Spartan. But the Greeks are, of course, realizing that in the broader scheme of things, we really need to recognize this man's authority as a Spartan, as a representative of the empire that's in power right now. So anyway, they, they walk away, they, they acquiesce, right? They lay poor Agassius at the, at the hands of Cleander to do what he will. And so they recognize Cleander the Spartans got the final say by walking away. This is a really important gesture. This is an important statement of deference. But then Xenophon and the generals go back and they tell the soldiers, okay, let's not actually let this get to trial if we can avoid it. Let's go back. And now that we've really entrusted Agassius to, to Cleander, Let's go beg for mercy. And so the generals, so Xenophon gets a few more uh, character witnesses. They bring along a fellow Spartan, actually, one of the captains or something, for some added social proof. And they go back and they make an embassy on behalf of Agassius and the other soldiers. Xenophon, of course, is doing the talking now. And he says to Cleander, You have the men, Cleander, and the army has bid you to do what you pleased, both with these men and with their entire body. So he's saying, you know, not just them, the whole army is really at your mercy. You know, our fate is in your hands. But now they beg and entreat you to give them the two men. I guess it's two men. Agassius and the other guy. Give them the two men and not to put them to death. For many are the labors these two have performed for the army in the past. Should they obtain this favor at your hands, they promise you in return that if you wish to be their leader, and if the gods are propitious, they will show you 
not only that they are orderly, but that they are able with the help of the gods while yielding obedience to their commander to feel no fear of the enemy. Notice what he does there. You're the one with the power. There's a, there's a sign of deference there, sign of friendliness. Then he establishes, these guys deserve a good turn. They've, they've fought with us. They're very special to us. They're good men. They deserve mercy. So it's kind of an appeal on the basis of justice in a way. And uh, they've certainly made the case that Dexippus is a bad man and that, uh, that justice is really on the side of Agassius and, and the, the Greeks of the army. But then, once he's established that kind of moral upper hand, the moral soundness of his request, then he peppers it in with, and here's what's in it for you. Not that that's why you should do it, but if you do a, you know, show mercy... Well, you know, you could have this whole 8,000 man strong army fighting for you and look at how well they're behaving. You know, we're not chasing you to your ships. We're, uh, we're, we're calmly restraining ourselves. These are men who know how to obey. This is not why you should do it, that you could have a free army at your command, but rather because you're a good man and you do things because they are just and noble and honorable. But, you know, here's a little sweetener for you. So I think that's very good negotiation rhetoric. He continues on here. They make this further request of you that when you have joined them and assumed command of them, you make trial of both Dexippus and the rest of them to see how the two sorts of men compare and then give to each what he deserves. Upon hearing these words, Cleander replied, Well, by the twin gods, my answer to you will be Speedy indeed, I give you the two men, and I will myself join you, and if the gods so grant, I will lead you to Greece. These words of yours are decidedly the opposite of what I have been hearing about you from some people, namely that you were trying to make the army disloyal to the Lacedaemonians. End quote. And I think at the end here, Xenophon is hinting that this Dexippus guy is the very one that's been making all these nasty claims, both about the army and about Xenophon in particular, all along. He's been saying to Cleander, oh, Xenophon's trying to commandeer this army. He's a nasty Athenian, and he just wants to you know, cause trouble for us Spartans, which is nonsense, of course. But, um, you know, it's a lesson here about what happens when people are nasty. Uh, at the end of the last book, Xenophon made a speech about how the very men who were always shirking and lazy and complaining when the going was tough in the mountains and in battles, but these were the same men who, when they were in peacetime, having it an easy time of it, they were arrogant and reckless and, you know, abusing local tribes and you know, stealing and things like that. If a person is bad in one way, chances are they're going to be bad in other ways. So don't let yourself be bad in any way and be on the lookout for people who are. That's what Xenophon would advise, at least. So Xenophon and Cleander, they become guest friends. They become uh, Xenoi. And Cleander stays and hangs out for a few days. Then he makes sacrifices to see if he should lead the army. And the gods tell him, no. He may have been wanting to avoid a conflict with Pharnabazus, the Persian satrap, the Persian governor here. Byzantium is right across the straits from Asia Minor, right across the Bosporus, that is, from Pharnabazus's territory. Makes a lot of sense to try to avoid provoking the Persians if he doesn't have to. So maybe that's what the gods were trying to tell him when he sacrificed. But he says he'll be happy to help the army out in any other way that he can. And so they leave on good terms. The army offers him the whole flock of sheep that was in dispute. And he accepts the sheep and then he gives them back. And with that, the army does a little bit of raiding. And they finally make their way via land to a place right across the straits from Byzantium on the Asia side. In the territory of Chalcedon. Still a long way from home. But finally feeling like they've made some progress. And hopefully you feel the same way. 
One more book of adventures in Xenophon's Anabasis to go. More strange locals, more hilarious parties, more life lessons and classic strategies of leadership and speaking and persuasion from the one and only Xenophon of Athens. Thanks for listening. Stay strong. Stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Till next time.